right now we are discussing women's agency in the past and in this lecture i would be continuing with the same discussion as i was doing in the preceding lecture so we were discussing different types of women that have been studied by feminist scholars by undertaking a detailed analysis of the available literature and the sources so discussing the sangam literature uh, and the epics like uh, sila padikaram mani mekalai three types of or three categories of women that emerged in this literature or which were projected in this lit literature were the good wife or a talented courtesan or uh, a bhikkhuni who had renounced now giving you examples of these three categories of women one can talk about kannagi who was projected as the good wife who possessed the sacred power that was derived from the purity of her uh, behavior and conduct the dutiful wife then there was madhavi who was the beautiful and the talented courtesan who excelled in the art of providing pleasure and due to which uh, uh, kovalan who was kannagi's husband deserted kannagi and went to madhavi then the third category of uh, women that was projected was mani megalai who renounces her life as the object of a prince's desire and she uh, became a bhikkhuni and decided to serve humanity so these were the different kind of projections that emerged and uh, while kannagi was the dutiful the obedient the ever loving wife uh, who accepted her husband even if he had deserted her then there was the courtesan who was very charming and who was uh, ever ready to please her uh, paramours and then there was mani mekalai who has been described Uh, as a dancer with a begging ball because ultimately she renounced everything and she became a bhikkhuni so therefore uh, uh, in these kind of projections what is important is to study women on the margins now none of these women they belong to royalty they were not queens but then epics were written around them or they were mentioned in the epics they uh, plays were written around them so this uh, definitely is an interesting way of studying about uh, past then as we are talking about women on the margins these three kind of projections were also seen in the pali buddhist texts you know the three kind of projections like the wife the courtesan and the bhikkhuni and women on the margins in the pali textual tradition were described as the dasi or a woman in servitude now a, a very interesting and informative study of women in primitive buddhism was devised by was developed by i b horner as early as the 1930s and horner's sensitive portrayal of women in buddhism which was largely based on his study of jatakas and milinda panha uh, broke the binaries of colonialism nationalism in historical writing by giving a detailed information and categorization of women as they appeared in buddhist literature so a uh, uh, horner uh may did a detailed study of women who attained a higher spiritual level and who were ready to attain a higher spiritual level so he studied lives of numerous women who gave up domestic life and they had a spiritual bent of mind so the jain order of nuns consisted of several women wanderers who were freelance debaters who were philosophers seeking the ultimate truth so it was not as if only uh, uh, men were renouncing the world and they were getting converted and they were becoming wanderers and philosophers a large number of women also were doing so but sadly they have not really been studied to the same extent for example bhadda kundala kesin who was an avid debater 
uh, and she toured the country in search of knowledge. She was ordained into the Buddhist order by Buddha himself uh, with the words Kam Bhadda, Kam Bhadda uh, and now you are welcome to join the Buddhist order. Then uh, another uh, discourse of a nun was described as Buddha Vachana itself. So, uh, another such woman known as Dhamma Dina, uh, sh uh, she was a citizen of Raj Gaha, uh, who went into the state of homelessness state even without her husband Visakha. So, here we have example of a wife who renounced uh, the life of a householder and her husband Visakha uh, fully supported her in this endeavor and in fact he uh, organized a very warm uh, send off. He organized a golden palanquin to kind of bid uh, farewell to his wife uh, and on gaining a hunt-ship, she returned to Rajgeha as a nun and had a philosophical discourse with her husband who was still a layman. Now, this is mentioned in Kula Vedala Sutta. So, uh, understanding or exploring these kind of uh, writings uh, definitely opens uh, a much broader window to the past and it also questions the very myopic and a very uh, you know uh, a one track projection uh, that had been undertaken of the past by the colonial and the nationalist scholars. Now carrying forward further our discussion, uh, I would be discussing about the importance of women's agency in the past. So it is not as if women came on their own or they became independent minded thinkers only in the present times or only after getting educated. If we minutely look at a number of fables or uh, uh, Panchatantra Kathas or uh, the various uh, songs uh, and uh, the various poems that uh, can be you know uh, uh, explored from the available literature, there emerges a concept of woman worker. While nationalists like R. C. Dutt and Altekar studied and classified upper caste women into daughters, mothers, wives and widows. Feminist historians brought in the concept and the category of woman worker in addition to all the other ex existing categories. So, the woman worker, when we talk about the woman worker, it could be a, a, a maid servant working in the house of a householder, in the house of cities, or it could be a courtesan. So, basically all the women who were not dependent, who were not being dependent on a husband, father or children. Uh, so, sometimes they were the courtesans who gained a livelihood through their skills like singing, dancing, entertaining besides other women workers who supported themselves by watching over the paddy fields or drawing water from the rivers or working in the house of the richer households. So, it is in this background that one can talk about Dasis and a gender inclusive history. So, some of the Dasis had tremendous powers of reasoning and they also understood the importance and they even respected their own work. Now, uh, Uma Chakravarti has uh, undertaken a deeper uh, analysis uh, of the experiences of some of the Dasis and uh, the common sense of a Dasi uh, known as Punna, the name of that Dasi was Punna has been described by uh, Uma Chakravarti in one of her works. Uh, Punna was a Dasi who was working in the household of uh, Ananda, uh, uh, Anantha Pindika who was a famous Sethi. Now, uh, she had guts and intelligence to question a Brahmana who was making dips in the river and he was shivering because it was very cold. So, she asked that Brahmana as to why uh, he was uh, inflicting such uh, misery and such suffering on himself. Why is he was doing that? Why he was taking dips in river uh, time and again? Because she used to see him doing that every day. Now, the Brahmana replied that he was trying to acquire merit through these ritual dips 
that he took in the water and he uh, justified this action saying that probably he would achieve salvation. Now, Punna very logically replied that this meant that the frogs and the fishes who were living in the water also must be going straight to heaven because instead of only taking the ritualistic dips, these uh, you know living beings were living in water itself. So, look at the witty observation and look at the uh, you know uh, 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 the power to question, the authority to question uh, a Brahman that was witnessed. Now, the sly humor and the common sense of the Dasi made the Brahmana realize his uh, action the, the, and so he gave up on this meaningless rituals. Now, this was the kind of story that was there which was analyzed by, uh, uh, by the scholar. Now, another uh, example of such a dasi was that of Kali. Kali was a dasi who worked for a mistress called Videhika. Now, Videhika had a very good reputation among the neighborhood that she was very sweet natured, she was very even tempered and gentle and she was very kind to her uh, servants. But Kali had an idea and she thought that my mistress is good behavior, she had, she has good behavior to, uh, towards me, not because by nature she is gentle and kind. It is good because of me, because of the kind of diligence and discipline and hard work with which I perform my duties. So, therefore, she tried to conduct a test and uh, she tried to check whether her mistress was genuinely good natured or was she uh, good because of Kali's own behavior. And uh, for doing this, she started getting up late for three successive mornings. And finally, the mistress lost her temper and she assaulted Kali on the third morning when she did not wake up on time and perform her duties properly. So, ultimately Kali uh, displayed her blood splattered head to the neighborhood to prove wrong the mythical gentleness and greatness of the mistress and the unacknowledged worth of her own labor. So, what was the starting point of this whole story? The starting point of the whole story was the confidence of Kali on her own labor, on her own discipline, on her own uh, efficiency as a good worker that she did not give credit to her uh, mistress for uh, being good natured. So, uh, so there are uh, these kind of stories that can be interpreted and uh, from the point of view of uh, genderization of history. Now, coming to the aspect of reinterpreting the myths, the myths are there, they are not going to change, they have been handed down from generation to generation, but the task of a historian is to reinterpret the myths and to try to understand the context in which these myths were kind of developing. So, uh, there are a number of hymns that uh, kind of sing praises of the goddess of dawn that is Ushas. You know, uh, during Rig Vedic period, uh, there were a lot of hymn, hymns that were composed in uh, for praising Ushas. Now, while this indicates a goddess tradition, but there are several other hymns which kind of counter this uh, whole tradition of a goddess being worship because these hymns refer to the gods smashing her chariot clearly suggesting a certain hostility towards uh, Usha's chariot and uh, her projecting uh, and by projecting these kind of uh, uh, you know stories in which uh, the true nature of the patriarchal society that was emerging and the complex picture of gender binaries that were developing can be evolved. So, myths must be understood in their social context. Uh, the analysis of the Urvashi and the Pururavas myth that has been undertaken by D. D. Kosambi also uh, 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 is very relevant from this perspective. The love between an apsara and a human man uh, and the various conditions that Urvashi set upon him 
for their marriage so how this myth unfolds over a period of time and there are different versions of this myth that appear in the rig veda the mahabharata and the vikramorvashiya that was written by kalidas there are significant changes in the narrative and there definitely uh, appears to be a a uh, transgression and a more uh, hostile approach uh, towards describing urvashi and also uh, the the demands that she made on the human man so kosambi attributed these two changes in the structure of society which made for uh, you know uh, existence of these uh, uh, divergences these differences in the power relationships between men and women that were becoming more and more complex they were becoming more and more defined they were becoming more and more patriarchal uh, from rig vedic period onwards so uh, romila thapar uh, examined the story of shakuntala across time and highlighted the narrative shifts that reflected the changing gender relations here again we see that uh, uh, the very romantic image of shakuntala the carefree image of shakuntala was genuinely getting appropriated by uh, uh, by the projection of a image of a woman who easily gave way to the demands uh, of sexuality so uh, another very interesting uh, subject that has been studied by the scholars is that of women and piety while many inscriptions were inscribed on behalf of kings and important men to claim recognition for uh, a range of pious deeds that were accomplished by them like donations uh, and a large number of inscriptions were carved in stone uh in order to highlight in order to inscribe and uh in order to make it permanently visible for generations uh however none of these inscriptions uh, or very few of such inscriptions were carved in stone by women and these inscriptions however were not really studied in much detail it is only of late over the period of last 3 to 4 decades that there has been attempt by the scholars to uh, undertake a detailed analysis and research of such inscriptions that were carved in stone by women also for the construction of stupas and monasteries to claim merit for their piety so clearly there is a uh, Uh, something called women as donors it was not only men who were donors it was not only kings who were donors but women were donors too and recent studies have led to important issues being looked at such as the proportion uh, the proportion of women donors to men you know so how many women donors were there as compared to men donors and the way women describe themselves in the inscriptions so some women describe themselves as the wives or mothers and daughters or some describe themselves as bhikkunis so it was not as if uh, women all women kind of subsumed their uh, uh, identity with the identity of their of the male members of their family so it is in this perspective that one can talk about women's agency research on women's access to property or to incomes and the agency displayed by them in seeking to record their piety as individuals rather than being content to be overpowered or overshadowed or subsumed by the piety of the male members of their family so a deeper understanding of gender as an important element of exploring history can definitely make uh, a, a change in the way we write and we understand history now uh, in this background i would like to highlight another very important development that is emerge that is questioning the boundaries between production and reproduction by production we mean the various production activities you know the like cultivation or artisans craftsmanship 
the working of various uh, production processes uh, and by reproduction of course reproducing giving birth uh, the child bearing and child rearing roles of women. So, the scholars of late have pointed out that there is a need for a paradigm shift in thinking and writing history. This is because the world of production and the world of reproduction have been described as binaries with history dealing either with power or with production, but not as including reproduction as a critical element in understanding social relations. So, what is of prime importance in the entire discourse or in this entire uh, you know uh, uh, phenomenon of understanding history or writing history is to give detailed analysis to emergence of complex social relations. So, there has to be a paradigm shift and this paradigm shift will happen only when these binaries are finally replaced and all of the human experience is brought into the framework of history you know without creating a hierarchy of social or cultural or economic relations. So, this entire human experience which would also give which would also accommodate the experiences of the females uh, and an important beginning has been made in the works of a few practitioners of gender history. So, there has been a study of social reproduction of inequality uh, and with more and more uh, scholarship you know with greater scholarship that is now focused on studying social reproduction. So, that all the categories of women can be brought into the framework of history writing. So, there is a need to outline the relationship between caste, class, patriarchy, region, state, language and its institutions and break down the false divide between gender history and mainstream history because there is nothing called gender history per se. Uh, history has to be uh, gender sensitive and mainstream history has to accommodate different categories and a study of different institutions. So, it is in this background that now we can talk about a different theme and a new theme, but a very much interrelated theme that is the idea of chaste widows and cunning wives. This idea had been carefully developed in the traditional uh, Brahmanical literature and it was handed down from generation to generation and it is for the gender sensitive uh, historians to highlight this and to understand as to how the central place that was occupied by the wife in the whole system of perpetuating the social order and in enabling men to gain immortality through their sons was devised by Manusmriti. So, it is very important to it was very important to harness a wife's reproductive power and this whole uh, uh, concept of harnessing a wife's reproductive power leads us to this concept of chaste widows and cunning wives. So, there had to be a subordination of reproductive power and this was consciously attempted in ancient India. Reproductive power was the one power that women still had in the new structure of relations in which they were subordinated because biologically it was only women who could give birth. It was only women who could carry forward the uh, you know the legacy of the family who could provide sons. So, therefore, it was very crucial to deal with that reproductive authority, reproductive agency and power of women. There was a need to exaggerate and treat that reproductive power as an extremely dangerous power, you know, if not controlled. So, therefore, we have Brahma, uh, we have uh, Dharam Sutras, we have Smritis, and uh, so many other uh, uh, Brahmanical texts, the Manu Smriti. Uh, and so many other uh, legal texts that were devised from time to time to deal with this whole 
problem of uncontrolled sexuality of women. So, uh, how was this to be achieved? This was to be achieved by developing a whole notion of the innate nature of women. That women by nature are evil. Women by nature are uncontrolled. They have their own weaknesses in life. And if they are not controlled through dharma or through rules and regulations or norms or traditions, then they can go haywire. And what will be the result of this uh, uh, you know this uh, chaos the result would be Kaliyuk. So therefore uh, this discourse needs to be understood with uh, greater attention and this would be my uh, theme for the next lecture. Uh, I hope you enjoyed today's lecture and you would also undertake a detailed understanding and reading of all the resources that were mentioned in the course of the lecture. Thank you.